Welcome to a special episode of Track Talk. Today's episode is a segment from Live from My Drum Room with Matt Chamberlain from March 6, 2023. My old pal Matt Chamberlain, we had a great conversation, a great show, and in this little segment we talk about his iconic drumming on the Wallflowers One Headlight, and uh, we sort of segued into Fiona Apple's Criminal, another iconic track that Matt played on. Um, I encourage you to check out the entire episode. I'll, of course, put the link in the description here so you can watch the whole episode if you haven't seen it. But check this out. At the end of our conversation, I'm going to play uh, One Headlight and Criminal back to back, and you can hear Matt's playing. And we talk about uh, specifically during One Headlight, there's no cymbal crashes at all throughout the song, and that was a conscious decision that Matt made. You'll, you'll hear us discuss that, and it, it really is such a special track to me. I've always loved and appreciated it, and uh, it was great to talk about you know, what he was thinking at the time of that. So check it out. I hope you enjoy it. I'll see you on the other side, and uh, check out this conversation with Matt Chamberlain and myself. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And as I said, I'll see you on the other side. Thanks. Yeah, so I took lessons from him, from, from Garibaldi, from Murray Spivak, and then Chuck Flores was also around. You know about Chuck Flores? I do, yes, yeah. And he, I would go to his house, and he just had a little practice pad set up, and he just had me work out a bass drum, bass drum control doing um, stuff around the kit, more just like getting around, uh, uh, what do you call it, like independence kind of exercise. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I was kind of bouncing around with those guys for a little bit. And then I went to Dave, I mean, uh, went to Greg Bissonnette's house for a lesson. And he was the guy that completely blew my mind. Cause I mean, he, I think he was like 22 years old at the time or something, you know, I was 16. Yeah. And yeah. He, had, he had a thing set up in his backyard with his drum kit and his brother was living with them. And um, he taught me how to like read, charts you know big band charts and <clears throat> he gave me a sheet of paper with all of these um influential records i should check out you know like, yeah like three quartets or every you know like t tower power records or uh you know and i was like wow i've never heard of any of this stuff i need to check this out and um he and he was the guy that encouraged me to go to north texas because that's where he went um so yeah, that was a good time because there were all these guys living in town and you can, I just would call the musicians union up and go, Hey, can I have, or do you have uh David Garbaldi, Baldi's phone number? And I would go take lessons from him for a while. And then that's great, man. Wow. I even went to Mark Craney's house. Remember Mark Craney? I do. Yeah. Um, Rest I went in to peace, play. Mark. Yeah. Yeah. He, remember he had his, he was a lefty. So he had his drum kit set up left-handed. Then he set up another drum kit for me and I, Took a lesson from Wackerman. Yeah. I think I transcribed, I transcribed like ship arriving too late to save a drowning witch. And I brought it to him and I was like, is this right? Did I do this? <laughs> I have no idea. I just, this is like improvisational. <laughs> you guys don't like play all these. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, so you just answered a So, so you, you were pretty good and probably still are a pretty good reader. I mean, you could read pretty well back then having studied with all those great teachers and working out of these books it helped a lot yeah i mean i got yeah. really i got really into it i mean my my goal back then when i was 16 was to play with this guy you know i wanted to play yeah. with Zappa. i just was obsessed with frank Zappa. you'd never know it by the records i played on but. <laughs> well yeah no that's 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 really really cool that's very insightful because I was going to ask you, like, as a young drummer, who some of your influences were, like, and you mentioned Stuart Copeland and probably Menu. Menu, I'm guessing, came later, but you were probably into the police and. Yeah, it was like all the usual suspects, you know, like at the time, like it was, in, you know, in the early 80s, I was into all of the, the great drummers. I, I mean, there were a lot of great drummers in popular music, which was yeah. awesome. Um, you know, everyone from Phil Collins to Terry Bazio to, you know, Bill Bruford to Neil Peart, Hart. probably. Neil, yep. Of course, Neil Peart, Peart um, Bonham, I have all the classic rock guys. Um, I just loved all, you know, yeah, usual stuff. I didn't get into jazz until I went to college. I just didn't have any friends growing up that were into jazz. 
you know? Yeah. And then, um, and so it was, it was, you get the gig with Edie and like early twenties, right out of, you know, like basically a year or so out of high school. And, and you're, you know, you're playing in a band that's, that had to have helped develop what I, what I look at, like, you know, your maturity, like you, you, you were playing so maturely for a younger drummer. Do you know what I mean? When I say that, like a lot of guys, I know when I was like in my early twenties, I just wanted to play a lot of drum fills. And I think it's a natural thing, especially for somebody like you, who obviously had tons of technique, have tons of technique. And I think the fact that you were able to, and chose to just I just think that's incredible, Matt. You know, I think a lot of younger drummers can learn from your example. Well, thanks. But, it, you know, it wasn't just me. It was the guys in the band telling me to chill out because I used to. <laughs> <laughs> like, Come on, man. Just just play. Okay, here's the verse and here's the chorus. Don't do a crazy fill. Just don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was 20 years old. I, I was out of my mind. I wanted to, like, throw down and play all the shit I liked, you know, and yeah. here, here were these songs that, you know, they just, you know, I, I don't know if you know this, a lot of people think I played on the first record. I did not play on the first record. That was I, Chris. I, Chris Witten. Yeah. I do know that. Yeah. Yes. And so, so they went and did the record, came back and um, the drummer you know, quit. He was, you know, pissed off obviously. Um, Cause the producer replaced him with a studio musician and, um, and the bass player, Brad, was my roommate. And he asked me if I wanted to audition. And so I did. And um, and I joined the band. And But it, it took a while for them to, like, like chill me out. Because I was, you know, I wanted to play, like, five over two over seven, you know. <laughs> was displacing the snares and, like, you know, the guitar player. Just, like give me the stank eye all the time, you know, just like, what the hell are you doing, dude? Just chill out. But that's yeah. what you do when you're that age. I mean, that's yeah. right. I mean, yeah, exactly. And that's why I, but that's why when I, you know, discovered you, you know, after the Edie Brickell gig and like in the early nineties and, you know, you were doing the uh, Saturday night live every week. And then you started up showing, you started showing up on all these other records and you were this really fully formed like mature studio player. And, and you kind of answered that question just in, in, in the conversation we were having when you said you moved to New York and, and decided you wanted to try to, um, cause I wondered that, like, did you make a decision in your mind? Like, I want to try to be a session guy or did producers start calling you and saying, I heard you on this record. I, I had you do this, you know, I want you to do this record with me like that, how you took that step. Yeah, I consciously just wanted to be a part of records because I just love the process of record making. I just love it. I love, you know, I engineer a lot. I just, you can't see this. But this is my recording studio. I have a, a room in um, the Sound City Studios complex. Yeah. Great. And, um, you know, I engineer everything here and I just love the whole process of it. I love um, learning and record drums are like my favorite thing to record. I think it's most engineers favorite thing to record. Cause it's just, there's so many possibilities with how to mic. So yeah, that was a conscious decision. I wanted to play with songwriters and on records and get into that whole world of record making. I just yeah. I think it's so fun and um, it's so creative. It's, it's more um, interesting to me than just being in a band. You know, which I mean, if you're in the right band, you can do some really cool shit. But bands are kind of like a self-contained unit of it's like a little box, you know, mm -hmm. uh, at least that's what I I've always thought. But um, yeah. And so I just really wanted to, you know, I, I put myself out there trying to like tell people, yeah, if you ever have anything you want to record or just let me know, I want to come and do it, you know, and. At the time, I was just like, well, just buy me lunch or something. You know, I just wanted to learn because you don't learn recording. I mean, you, you, you learn recording by doing it. You know, you have to listen back to yourself. You got to you know, sometimes you don't want to play as loud as you do live when you're recording. Mm -hmm. you know, so there's all kinds of variables going on. And yeah. it's just um, I love it. So that, you, that conscious decision for sure. Yeah. And you got comfortable with it pretty quick, I'll bet. I'll bet you really 
God, you know, like I, I'll give you an example. And I was telling my wife who says hello, by the way, Kelly Firth, my, and, and, um, she was very excited that you were going to be here with me today. And, um, but I remember, um, hearing the, the wallflowers tune one headlight back when it was on the radio and 25 years ago, turns out. And I, and I knew it was you. I remember hearing that it was you on the record and totally digging it, totally digging what you played. And I, and so today I was thinking, I'm going to listen to that. I haven't listened to that song in a while. Like really listened. I'll hear it on the radio, but I put it on today and I thought, if I remember correctly, Matt plays just bass drum, snare drum, hi-hat pretty much the whole time. I don't think there's really many fills in it. And sure enough, and I, you know, I encourage everybody at home watching this right now to check that song out because it is indeed, although I do hear one tom-tom, and this is the geek in me, there's a, a <laughs> fill at like three minutes, 56 seconds where you do like a little and you hit just a, a quarter note in the tom-tom, but... The beauty of it, Matt, is you don't hit one cymbal crash, right? I mean, throughout the song, it's all hi-hat, and it's all these little syncopated fills, and it's, it's so tasty. I just, I, it just it's, it's like what Jim, you know, like it reminds me of the stuff that Keltner does, like this really tasty, memorable stuff. And then today I was getting my hair cut, and it was playing on the Spotify channel that my hairdresser had and i said hey i'm gonna have this drummer on my podcast later today she's like really she was very impressed yeah well thanks yeah anyway well, you know how that came about i mean we were playing the song as a song that had you know the sections defined by you know a crash going into the chorus and yeah um and it was just the concept that um it came from i mean it's not a it's not uncommon to um not play a crash i mean there's plenty of examples you know sure there's tons I and mean, there's tons of records where there's no crash symbol but i remember at the time the bass player greg and i were really into that tom petty record um wildflowers mm -hmm. uh, you know that song you don't know how it feels yes yeah. he doesn't hit, he doesn't hit a crash at all on that song either and um i was like how about if i just don't hit a crash like steve ferroni and um it just kind of worked. It worked, yeah. It, you know, it's just a concept. It's more like a, it's just like, okay, let's take away some things that you would normally do and see if that helps the song because the song just wasn't feeling right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So sometimes you have to subtract instead of add more shit. You know? Yeah. Um, at least that's what we tried, and luckily it worked out. So. And, and I, I had made a note to ask you about that, if that was something that like the producer had suggested or maybe Jacob, maybe the songwriter or someone had said, you know, which which obviously happens all the time in the studio where they're, you know, someone, you know, makes a suggestion to the drummer or to somebody in the band. But that was your that was your idea. That was your you and the bass players. Was, yeah, I was just I, I just thought, you know, I, I told Greg, the bass player, I was like, hey, how about if we just try something like where I just don't hit a crash like that Tom Petty song? And we tried yeah. it and we're like, hey, that that works. Let's That's just great. do that. Yeah. And I was I remember like T-Bone Burnett produced that record. And I remember telling him, I was like, man, if you miss the crashes, we can just overdub them, you know? And he's like, no, I'll just leave it alone. Just leave it alone. Because I was yeah. going to overdub like some fills and crashes going into the sections. Um, but he was like, no, nah, just, just leave it like that. And I was like, all right, cool. <laughs> no, it's, it's yeah. And it's it's just such a great groove and it, it everything just works perfectly i'm going to read you a couple of comments um oh jimmy keegan's watching you you know jimmy keegan right mm -hmm. yeah maybe it's already been discussed but please talk about mark endert and the fiona apple production yeah well like on the first record i guess it would be the first record and i'd made a note of criminal too just just yeah. as, as an example of just some ridiculous playing, but, but yeah, maybe, maybe you could just talk about that for a second. Mm -hmm. Well, that record was also a process of, uh, you know, we would play it, you know, we'd play it live and it just didn't seem special, you know, like the, the producer at the time uh, really wanted it to be unique and different. And we just kept trying stuff and, 
Um, on that record, on those sessions, um, was John Bryan, who's become a well-known producer, soundtrack artist, mm. and, or composer. Um, and he brought, I remember he, at the time, he had just moved to LA, and whenever he would show up for a session, his cartridge would bring, like, drums and microphones and, like, clothes, because he wasn't living anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Clothes would show up and <laughs> boxes of microphones, just like weird, just like random. He had so many great drums. I ended up using a lot of his drums. So I was like, wow, you have like Radio King drums. And man. So he had a box of weird old microphones. And I I thought, well, let's make it sound like a, because at the time this was like probably 90, 94 or something yeah i think so yeah and that was when people were kind of getting getting into like drum loops on songs and there was like this whole like lo-fi like incorporating like hip-hop breakbeat sensibilities into a pop song you know like porous head at the time or like some of those british productions like massive attack yeah. and, and so um i thought well how about if we just mic the drums with this shitty mic that is just all mid range and I'll just play it, play it down. Maybe it'll sound like a drum loop or maybe we could chop it up later or something and make it loop. And, and we did it and Mark Ender the engineer put this, it's like an American mic. It's called a D 22. You've probably seen them like in videos, like they're very weird looking. They're like it's a metal looking thing. looks very sci-fi, but he just put it in front of the kit, like kind of right in front of the kick drum kind of like right there let's see the kick drum um and then just compressed it and eq'd it and then i think there was a kick drum mic and that was the drum sound and so i just heard that sound in my headphones and just played to it and that was an example of um like when you hear the sound of it you can't just play drums like you would normally play drums you have to kind of be light on the cymbals because mm -hmm. impression and the sound of the mic is so mid-rangey and harsh that you got to really like maybe even tape up the cymbals and like muffle stuff down. So, cause it is, it, you know, if you, if you compress a mic, it just draws everything into it. So if you have ringy toms or anything on the kit that's rattling, it'll come out. So yeah. And then we just did a couple takes like that and we we're like, wow, that's, that works. Let's wow. have the song like that. And, and that, and that was, that was, yeah. I think there's a sound of like a like a click or something i think it's like an mpc click that's part of the drum performance that i think mark ender had in the control room and we just use that as like the click track but he just kept it in the um the song as part of it it's almost like a cowbell kind of sound yeah yeah that's the, and 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 to your point that ha hearing that in your in your headphones like makes you play differently is what you're saying right it yeah, yeah. It forces it's, it's, you like same, it's like the same concept of like if you're a guitar player and you're playing with uh just plugged straight into an amp or versus plugged into like an effects pedal you're going to play differently you know like if it's like the effects pedal of drums you know having yeah compression or distortion or whatever it is if you hear it you're going to play differently based on hearing you know Absolutely. Yeah. I, I want to read you just a quick comment um, from Dave Abrazees again, who, uh, and he had mentioned this to me in a, in a message that uh, his first DW experience was on your kit in Seattle during his Pearl Jam audition. Oh yeah. And, I left, uh, it there. I left it there because he yeah. was, yeah. Yeah. And he said they became my dream drums because of the experience of that kit. So you, yeah. you helped a young drummer's dream come true. Matt Chamberlain. Yep, that's what you do. He left. I remember when I unpacked the cases when I got him back. He had he left me some funny messages or the guys did or something. I remember there were like some pieces of paper with like pictures and things. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Oh, Maybe I that was re that I can't remember. But yeah. <laughs>
Well, that's my show. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, give it a like, leave a comment. Even if you didn't like it, like it anyway. And, uh, but tell me why you didn't like it. Leave a comment one way or the other. I'm, I'm always working to make these shows better. So and in all seriousness, let me know what you think. I do appreciate it. Remember, no drummers are ever harmed during track talk or live from my drum room. And drummers, when in doubt, leave it out. Again, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you soon.